of stragglers left at the end of the semester here. <laughs> no, I'm killing me again. <laughs> All right, well, uh, yeah, so, so let's see. We started here. Your, your, your project check-ins were due, uh, what, yesterday? So your deliverables for this, this class are slowly uh, coming to an end. So, so all that's left, I think, is one more uh, nano quiz next week. And um, uh, your project uh, write-up and uh, your project presentation, neither of which can you use late days for which. Neither. Uh, uh, so so, so if, if, you, if, you're, if you're planning on turning in your project proposal late, um, that's fine, as long as you don't mind like getting no credit for it, your, your project. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so, so if you haven't used your late dates uh, so far, that's that's you know, tough, tough. Yeah. Just the write up uh, and imagery and uh, a warm feeling that that you have installed. What video can you use for? Yeah. So you guys are going to be giving presentations for your course projects, uh, and certainly in your uh, your presentation, uh, if, if you have uh, animation. You um, I did actually. Sophie brought up an interesting question, to which my answer is unfortunately no. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so I know some classes they permit the students to basically video their their talk ahead of time and just play it back. Uh, personally, I think it doesn't kill you guys. Get a little bit of home speaking experience. So we're not going to do that. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, however, uh, I do expect you guys to respect the time limit, uh, whatever it is. In the keep it on schedule. This class is actually slightly larger than, than usually when we, when we do uh, 87, which is great. Uh, but it does mean that while well, you guys can come in and out, you know, give your presentation and then leave, we're stuck here all day, uh, which uh, uh, means we really got to keep you on time, right? Like, because for every minute that each of you goes over, it's like an hour of time. <laughs> cool. Are there any questions about your project as you uh, reach for the end? And, oh, and, and yeah, and of course the the, the, the project that we deem the coolest, most interesting, whatever, by whatever standards we feel like being the most interesting standards, uh, we'll, we'll offer a trip to uh, Tigra. Yeah. And uh, any questions about your project or uh, what, what's going on next week? Cool. So our, 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 our plan for next week, uh, we have one more lecture on Tuesday. Uh, and then on Thursday, uh, we'll have kind of a, a special thing, which, which usually we do in 837, and I encourage you to all show up. Um, which is that we'll ask uh, graduate students and potentially faculty, although frankly they rarely show up, uh, 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 to present their, their research in, in computer graphics. We have a pretty sizable graphics group here at MIT, and, and many of these people are looking for your ops and, and have cool things to say. Uh, and, and so we'll book a schedule where, where they can pick a pitch to show you what they're up to. That's particularly interesting here at MIT because I think the three graphics faculty that we have are on like three very far ends of some spectrum or another in terms of like what we do and what our approach is, and so you'll, you'll see some, some pretty broad some pretty stuff. So, uh, it's an, also a good opportunity to learn about some of the graduate offerings that we have here, and, 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 uh, and to see uh, if there are any grad students you want to go hang out with and, and, and get your opt-in. Um, yeah, and then we'll have your presentations. Uh, what we're going to do, hopefully today or tomorrow, as long as uh, I remember to ask our TAs about it, is we will post a spreadsheet um, where I'm going to ask you guys to sign up for a particular time to give your presentation. I ask that you are on time to that. Um, some of the times will not be during our normal class time. Unfortunately, there are more of you than there are like, you know, minutes in this class when you multiply by the length of the talk. Um, so we're going to ask for a little bit of flexibility. Uh, if you miss your assigned talk time, I'll have to agree. I'll have to decide whether I'm nice to let you another talk time. Uh, so I'll let that be my, my work. Uh, okay. So, uh, so with that, uh, I'm excited to see what you guys are up to, and, and I, I saw some pretty cool project proposals, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll deliver, which is great. Um, okay, so today, uh, if you're looking at the topics on the course spreadsheet, I changed them at the last minute, because I didn't feel like talking about hardware, and, and, and in the words of uh, Britney Spears, it's, it's my project. So uh, instead, uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about image processing, and then our next one, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, hardware. Uh, because your instructor likes to procrastinate on anything that involves a physical device. Uh, uh, okay, so 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 today uh, I'll talk about image processing, which is kind of a weird side topic uh, in this class, but one that's worth uh, acknowledging because it really is largely part of the computer graphics literature um, and uh, something that shows up in, in shaders. So it actually fits quite well with the last couple uh, lectures we had. Right. So if we think about the rendering pipeline, 
right, there, there are a lot of different pieces. Right? At the very beginning of this class, we started with geometry and deformation. Uh, we talked about animation. Um, from there, we talked about textures and rendering and so on. Um, but there's this final step that happens in almost every video game and uh, movie production pipeline, which is all of the hacks that happen afterward in screen space. Um, the, in, in particular, even if you render a 3D scene, uh, pretty, pretty typically afterwards there will be a pass or two of your rendering uh, 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 algorithm over just the pixels on the screen uh, to make different effects. Right? And, and so uh, I think many of you guys are, are familiar with these now in, in Instagram filters and so on. Um, but actually, even in, in the movie processing uh, you know, pipeline, after you generate your, your film, maybe you, you actually simulate some, some stuff just uh, on, on the pixel grid. This is actually a little bit surprising. Right? So, so uh, the, the, what I would call, what is the word that I'm looking for? Like a, a polite word for something that's not so good. Uh, the euphemism uh, people talk about is, is screen space rendering. The reality is it's a hack, right? Like you're not doing really anything about the, like the, the geometry of your scene or all the stuff you're trying to draw. You're just doing some stuff to make your image look a little better at the last second. By the way, my favorite example of this, and then we'll talk about the basic techniques. Uh, there was a SIGGRAPH paper about four or five years ago that talked about uh, uh, simulating uh, rain in a video sequence. Right? And rain, as you can imagine, is, is, is kind of a tough thing to get right in an animated film. Um, and actually, simulating rain is, is tough, right? I mean, you have water, potentially you could think about simulating water droplets that hit on the ground and they you know, stick together and there's reflectance that happens and flowing and animation and so on. Um, what these people did, and, and I believe this is actually what, what gets used, is they took photos of rain droplets, <coughs> and then they just did screen space rendering, where as a post-processing step, they basically just, on every frame of your video, randomly draw out rain posi position on your screen and splat an, an image of a raindrop on top. And the reality is that rain drops so quickly in front of your camera that just that basically random noise is, is more or less perceived as, as just rain falling on your scene anyway. Uh, and, and, and so there, there's some interesting techniques out there that really are extremely cheap and, and give you some interesting effects. Um, another good example of that uh, uh, are some of these things where you, you really want to simulate global illumination, but of course it's expensive. Um, but we know that global illumination happens largely near sharp edges, so maybe I just take the sharp edges in my, in my red scene and I throw them out a little bit. I call it global illumination. This has a uh, name, it's called ambient occlusion, uh, and, and it's a pretty common technique for global uh, illumination on, on your GPU. Okay, so today we're basically going back to 2D, uh, and, 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 and the basic idea is to do image processing that totally disregards uh, the three uh, content in your scene, uh, but still can make some interesting effects, whether that's your hipster sepia tone, uh, or something a little more uh, convincing. Yeah. And of course, uh, there are a lot of different ways to think about these problems, and, and they're a little bit different. Um, from the language that we've used before. Uh, one thing that you'll notice when you read uh, research papers and tutorials and so on in this area is that they sort of have two different views of the world that are, are sort of dual to one another. And, and we mentioned this in, in the Fourier lecture as well, which is really how to think about an image, right? That, uh, uh, you know, from a, from a discrete viewpoint, you know, an image or photograph is really a two-dimensional array of pixel values, right? So every location here is an RG and a B. Um, and of course, there's this other view of the world where an image is really like a two-dimensional function, right? So for every x, y position, uh, there's a color. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, sampling is what relates these two things. Uh, the reality is that uh, when you go through the computer graphics literature, essentially all you have to remember is that these two symbols are more or less the same. Uh, the, you know, if you sum something over an image, that's like taking an integral of a function and, and vice versa. Uh, and essentially. What's to realize is that every once in a while you look at an image processing paper and it looks like some really crazy calculus is happening, but it's really just bad notation. There's, there's nothing more than that. Um, so we'll see that a little bit. But uh, in order to think about different representations, uh, there's all kinds of different perspectives you can take when you talk about image processing. Um, another one is how to think about video, uh, which I think is, is kind of an interesting challenge, and one that actually is largely unexplored, right? Uh, if you look, you know, tools like Photoshop and so on, I would argue, are far more developed than their sort of video editing peers, like uh, Premiere. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is if you take your favorite image filter and you just apply it to every frame of video sequence, uh, oftentimes you'll just see noise. Uh, and the, the reason is that there's nothing about that that has to be temporally coherent, right? You have a, you, oftentimes your, your, your image filters are, are designed in such a way that they make some discrete decisions that could change from frame to frame of video. 
Uh, and so actually an open research challenge is taking whatever your favorite image filter, whether it's like a medium filter or whatever, and just making it look okay as a, as a video sequence rolls. Um, one interesting related question to that, uh, if you think of an image like a function of x and y, then one question you might ask is how should you, how should you think about a video sequence? Uh, and, and a natural thing to do might be to say, okay, great, well, it's a function of x, y, and, and t. Uh, and, and, and that's perfectly fine. But one thing to note is that the units of those two things are different, right? x and y are in like inches and, and t's in seconds, or whatever your favorite metric version of the seconds is. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, you know, it's, it's not actually 100% clear, for instance, can I take derivatives in the image the same way that I take derivatives in time? Uh, and, and, and these are, are sort of interesting most philosophical questions that the image processing people have to answer. Um, but it also provides some interesting perspectives. So for example, in computer vision, uh, a, a, a typical question you might ask is trying to track an object as it moves around in front of a camera. Uh, and one way to do that is to say, well, I'm typically I think of image uh, videos as viewing one frame at a time. Right? So I'm, I'm basically viewing slices through that x, y, t sequence of things. But I could also look at like a single horizontal x value and all of the t values. Have you, has anybody ever seen a video process this way? I don't know if you, you understand what I'm saying. So, so here's, here's an image, right? And if I think of a video, this is a big sequence of images, like that. Right? And so typically the way we visualize video, I would argue, <laughs> is by showing one frame at a time and playing them. A different thing you could do would be to draw a stripe like this and look at the image where one axis is like x and the other one is t. This can actually tell you quite a bit about what's going on in your video sequence. Right? So for instance, if you have a person standing here and they're moving, what, what happens? You see like you know, some kind of a stripe that's moving around. It's the shape of that person as they walk. Right? Um, so there's some interesting perspectives that I think are a little subtle um, that, that provide some fun ways to think about that video data. Right, so for instance, when we talk about applying image filters, it doesn't have to be on the image space, it could be in, in this space instead. Okay, so of course, regardless, if, you, if we think of images and videos like arrays, um, you have to answer arrays of what? Uh, and, and I think so far, our basic model in this class is that we have RGB values usually in the range from 0 to 1, uh, or maybe, you know, you, you map that to some set of integers. Um, in reality, actually, if you look, certainly the TV movie production pipeline, this is not the way images Stored, um, but in fact, you have four values per pixel. Um, what's the what's the fourth one? Any idea? Alpha, exactly. Transparency. Yeah, and you can usually spot this in in, in, in low quality uh, edited videos. <laughs> um, so, like, if you look at news clips or another good one. So here's uh, Rebecca Black, and if you look at her, uh, I think it's the prototypical ad uh, uh, video clip. If you look at her shoulder. What do you see? There's this funny artifact here, right? So she's singing about Friday on a, on a, on a black background, and, and she's got this cool lighting effect behind her. But is the lighting on her shoulder consistent with what's going on behind her in the scene? No, right? What, what's going on uh, in, in, in this image? Why, why is it that Rebecca's shoulder somehow looks like it has a Fresnel effect? It doesn't. Matter. It's just, it's just the, the, the look. Is that really the background behind her? Yeah, it's a green screen, right? Uh, and, and, and so these are the, the kind of subtle effects that happen. Uh, and this is an example of a technique called compositing, right? So compositing is the idea that oftentimes we don't just render a scene in one shot, which I think is what most of you have implemented so far in this class, right? Like your ray tracers are just iterated over all the pixels at one time. But rather maybe you, 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 you render Rebecca Black, you do all of your favorite effects on her, you render the background, and then later you glue those two things together. And this is our first example uh, sort of an image or, or screen space uh, technique, right? Because we're going to do those as a loop over the pixels afterward rather than during the rendering uh, procedure. Right? So in general, uh, compositing is the term for combining a bunch of visual elements into just a single image. Uh, and, and the canonical example of that uh, is a green screen, right? So here, uh, Rebecca is probably actually singing against the screen, which is, which is some bright green color behind her back. Uh, and then, well, what happens if you do a for loop over your image? detect pixels that are close enough to bright green uh, 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 and then replace them with the, with the background. 
So in order to do this kind of thing, typically uh, when we store images, and if you look at most of the common formats, other than I think JPEG doesn't, doesn't do this by default, um, you store not just red, green, and blue, but also an additional uh, channel, which is like called alpha. Right? And alpha is roughly, uh, you can think of it like pixel coverage. Right? Like, so it's approximately the fraction of a pixel which is taken up by that RGB color. Or a different way of thinking about it is like transparency. Yeah? Um, and, and, and so, uh, right, so I think the way people typically describe alpha is that it's the fraction of your pixel color covered by your foreground layer, but of course this is a little bit BS, right, because what, what does it mean to have a fraction of a pixel uh, when you're rendering? It's, it's not so clear, right? You only get one color. Uh, and so what that means is that you have to come up with a policy uh, for, for how to do uh, alpha rendering. Does that sense? Cool. So, uh, Right, so the, the typical alpha uh, blending technique uh, kind of looks like this follows, right? So maybe I have a background, like my, my, my background image, my foreground one, and my foreground image additionally comes with one number alpha per pixel. Then rather than just displaying the foreground color on top, I basically take a weighted average between the background and the foreground, where the weight is determined by, by alpha. Incidentally, you can think of this as a one-dimensional, very centric coordinate if you're feeling uh, uh, fancy, but I, I, I don't think that's necessary. Um, so in fact, uh, there are a lot of sneaky things you can do. So for example, for example, maybe you always use the same background image, in which case you can use a technique called pre-multiplied alpha, which is to say, I never actually need, notice that I don't actually ever need color. Whenever I composite, I always take color and scale it by alpha. Yeah? But alpha and color are two different channels in my image. So I might as well just store that, that product and save myself three multiplies. Uh, and so that's a, 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 a trick called pre-multiplied alpha, which isn't terribly common. Is alpha blending particularly physical? No. And, and you have to be quite careful about this. You see that what can go wrong? Um, so in particular, the order in which you composite your images actually matters here. Right? So think about if I have like a 50% blue as my first alpha layer, and then 50% green, and then 50% red. What is that blue by the time I'm done with the computation? Well, it's 25% of my pixel color, right? The compounded. Or is it still 50% red, because that was the last thing I added? Um, so you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble that way. Uh, and so there's actually a, a policy decision rather than a physical one as to how you do your, your album. Um, but it can create uh, nice uh, in, uh, uh, 80s uh, images like this, this guy in this leather jacket here. Um, why do we choose bright green? Yeah, most humans are not bright green. Uh, and, 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 and so that's really that's the only justification uh, uh, for why, right? Is that, that bright green? I think it's, 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 it's perfectly politically correct to say it's pretty far from, from skin color. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, unless it, <laughs> if it isn't, then you, you might get that checked out. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's really the, the main rationale behind it. However, thinking back to that example of, of, of uh, this music video with uh, Rebecca Black singing about Friday, what's wrong with using green for your, for your, for your alpha, for your, for your, for your green screen? You got it. Green is a bright, bright color, and it reflects a lot of light outward, especially this shade of green, right? And remember, we saw this artifact on her shoulder where it looked like there was like this bright shadow happening here? Well, what was going on was the green, remember, this is, this has to do with uh, sort of the ambient you know, lighting that's going on. The, the, the green color bounced off of the green screen and onto her shoulder. It mixed with the, with the color of her jacket, so it no longer was green screen. The computer didn't detect it that way. But it did get lit, right? And so when you viewed it, you actually saw the green screen on her, on her, on her side here, um, which is definitely a non-physical effect, right? And so some of the more modern uh, green screen uh, tools actually kind of shy away from this uh, because they create some really bad artifacts right at the, the edges. And I think you can all see that, right? Like I think pretty often in, I think, TV advertisements late at night, you see like pretty bad green screen compositing. You can always spot it from a mile away. Uh, and it's typically because of this, this bad artifact. Uh, to make matters even worse, of course, uh, there's some fashion decisions that are uh, affected by this. You know, if you see a newscaster, very rarely will you see them wearing green clothing um, because of what you're going to tell us about your wardrobe malfunction at the wedding, Kim Kardashian's wedding. wedding, and then you had one a short time yes. ago. Here, this is weird. <laughs> the green shirt you were wearing, and it just. Yeah. yeah. TV 101, my friend. You, you can't wear green. <laughs> it's it's kind of a fun. Uh, but that little 
yeah. example where actually the uh, you know the technology is affected the fashion that you see on, on TV. It's kind of a weird thing if you think about it too much. Um, okay. Uh, kind of one of the interesting things, if you think back to, uh, we, we talked in this class about uh, CSG. There's sort of a CSG analog that you can do with alpha channels. Right, so you don't just have to use alpha for blending, you could also say that alpha, you know, is one if you're inside an object, zero if you're outside an object. So if you want to do the and of one object or another, then you would check if that number is one and both of them. Right, uh, and so you can like at the intersection between a circle and a square this way, uh, and, and so on. And the nice thing, they call this compositing alpha, uh, uh, compositing algebra, because it really does look like algebra. So for instance, let's say that I wanted the, the and of, of two images. How would I get that from the alpha channel? And multiply. You see that? Because one times one is one, one times zero is zero. Yeah, so one of these guys is a one, and the other has a zero. Then I'm going to make the alpha of the composited thing zero, because it's not uh, together for both of them. Yeah? And so there's actually a whole algebra you can get. I encourage you guys to sit and think, uh, figure out the different formulas that you need to, to, to make each of these, these tricks work. Um, right, so uh, in general, uh, compositing is a nice example uh, of, of, of what I would call just a color space operation. So in other words, it just takes an RGB value and maps it to another one. In this case, in a nonlinear way, right? it says if you're close to green, have a, you know, replace your color with the background, otherwise leave it alone. Um, but this is a nice example of a uh, calculation that falls into the SIMD architecture. Do you all remember what this stands for? Oh, yeah, this is like the most course participation I've had all semester. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Uh, <laughs> right, so, uh, uh, yes, yeah, single instruction, multiple data, right? The fact that there are lots and lots of pixels with different RGBs, you're running them all through the same uh, filter uh, uh, F here. Right? And of course, there are many uh, color space operations out there that show up uh, in image processing. And kind of one of the fun things is like designing these functions is not terribly complicated, uh, but they can have some pretty cool effects. Uh, so, so, so one example, uh, probably the simplest one, of course, if you take a dimly lit uh, photograph, uh, you multiply it by constant, it becomes bright, becomes brighter lit. I don't think that's terribly surprising. Um, a slight uh, a variation of this would be to uh, increase the contrast of a photograph. Any idea how, how you might do that? How can I increase the contrast in the photo? There's no right answer, by the way. I mean, there's like 20 years of the literature on, on increasing contrast. It's the, the thing people don't have a great deal. So let's say I have a black and white photograph. Yeah? Um, what does contrast mean? So, so in my mind, contrast is sort of like a variety of colors from, from dark to light instead of just like all sitting in some side of some island, right? So maybe I go over my image, and I click the histogram, so this is black, this is white, okay, here's grayscale here. And I look at my image, I have some distribution of colors, so maybe here's the dark mountain, the, the light mountain, and maybe here's the sky. Then what? Yeah. Let's go it out. Yeah, right? I could just find a scale that takes that value there and this value here, uh, and, and that would certainly uh, increase the contrast of my, my image. Uh, one, one problem might be that I scale it in such a way that everything in this band gets mapped to black, in which case I've effectively just removed part of my, my photograph. Yeah. Um, of course, that's not just, that's, that's the, the simplest thing you can do. Um, there are other cool ones. Uh, let's see here. Oh, maybe I'll describe my favorite one really quick. It's sort of a medical image. Um, so in medical imaging, like here's the thing, like do you guys have a good intuition for what a CT scan of a liver should look like? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so that actually in a funny way is artistically kind of liberating for people that do medical imaging because they can do all kinds of weird image filters on the CT because their goal is to help the doctor see the interesting features, it's not to capture it in real life, right? Uh, and, 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 and so for instance, one of them I do is say, can I take the colors of my image and edit them in such a way that my distribution over color is flat. Right? Can I run some per pixel filter that does that to the colors? Uh, the idea being that now every part of grayscale gets used equally much. Right? So this is sort of the best contrast enhanced image. By the way, these look terrible if you do them in the photos. Yeah. Any idea how you would do that? Anybody take a probability class? 
So if you think of this like a probability density, right, like a Gaussian or something, right? So this is some function rho of, of x equals to this x, right? Saying so sort of the density like a number of pixels that have different brightnesses, right? I can construct a function called a c d f. This is the integral of rho of x. So it looks like uh, that. <laughs> So if I take all of the pixels uh, in my image and I run them to the inverse of this function, then what you'll get out is an image with uh, uh, a flat distribution of colors. Uh, I'll let you guys check that at home. It's a good calculus exercise. Um, this is also how, uh, if you take a probability class and you have a coin and you want to make it a biased coin, right? So you have some, you can like I can sample from an unbiased distribution. I can flip heads or tails, uh, but I really like to flip from a coin that. that 75% of the time is heads. Right, how would I do that? Uh, the machinery is quite similar. It's, it's the same math. Because right? you're trying to take sort of a biased distribution and make it unbiased. Yeah. Um, so this is called contrast enhancement. And, and essentially, the basic idea here is that you can apply any filter you want to the, the pixel colors. Right? Uh, uh, and and what will come out is just some remap image where maybe brightness in like dark colors is accentuated more or, or whatever. Um, how many of you guys have seen a plot like this inside of Photoshop or, or some photo editing tool? It's, it's a pretty common thing where they'll actually just have you draw this function that remaps the pixel colors. Um, notice that this is a nonlinear thing, but it's still SIMD, right? You still run every pixel through the same weird nonlinear function. Uh, another thing you could do is uh, desaturate. Uh, so, so here I just want to take a photograph and convert it to grayscale. That's another one we can do. Uh, if you look at the typical ways that, that your image editing tools do that, um, they use uh, a tool like this. So here, Y uh, stands for, for gray, because G stands for green. Yeah. If you were doing CMYK, you'd be a little bit of trouble here, but, but they're not. Um, and notice it has a, a, a very strange uh, formula here. And the, the grayscale is, is and, and this is pretty typical. Uh, uh, people use 0.3 times the red channel, plus 0.59 times the green plus 0.11 times the, the, the blue channel. Why is it that I don't just take all three out together and divide by three? This lecture is a great one to kind of synthesize some of the things we see. So I hear somebody whispering at that. No, no, it's quite. Yeah. The difference is in wavelengths. This is true, they're three different colors, but specifically, why, why these three ratios? Yeah. Our eyes react to the different colors. Your, yeah, your eyes are more sensitive to green than they are to blue uh, <coughs> or red, right? And this is approximately the ratio of, of the different types of cones in your eye. Uh, and, and so if you're converting to grayscale, uh, this is sort of simulating the sensitivity that you actually experience uh, in, in your intensity. Does that make sense? So it's, it's a nice example where, where actually the, the, once again, perception is really what's driving uh, uh, how we design these, these tools. Right, and so, so a pretty typical thing uh, to do is, of course, to take an image, and I should replace this photograph, by the way, but, but the, to take an image and, and uh, uh, just remap the, the different pixel colors. Uh, and there's like lots of nice user interfaces for, for drawing this. Um, essentially, a lot of the, the user interfaces, what they'll do is they'll show you the histogram of colors before and after you apply your map, uh, and that way it allows you to kind of understand uh, the, the brightnesses in here. Incidentally, this photograph is a famous one in the image processing literature, and one that's really quite shameful in the computer graphics community. Uh, you should read about it uh, uh, and, and see why it's just a great early example of really sexist, terrible behavior among computer scientists. Um, and uh, it's called Lena, and I'll let you uh, Google that. I read the Wikipedia page and not look at the original. Um, but it really is, is a bad example of uh, saying the image processing, so I should, I should remove that image. In any event, uh, okay, so, so in uh, terms of, of different uh, filters, one of the big challenges here uh, is something called dynamic range. Uh, next semester, Fredo Duran is offering computational photography class, if you like this kind of stuff. Uh, so, so, which was news to me, I thought it was in the fall. But cool, it's in the spring. Um, right, so, so, so the idea of dynamic range is that when you take photographs, particularly of churches, I think that's a pretty typical example, um, there's an issue. So, so here's a church, I believe, I believe this is actually the Stanford Church in, in, in California, but I could be wrong. Um, so, uh, what's the thing about these big Gothic cathedral-style buildings? Well, you have these 
big, flat marble walls, which are blocking all the sunlight. And then you have this beautiful stained glass window in the front of the room, which is led, like, oftentimes pointed like, straight at the sun, trying to bring all the light into to your scene. Right? Uh, and, and of course, this is designed in what, the Middle Ages on purpose this way. Right? This kind of a godlike effect going on in your church. Um, but from a photography standpoint, it, it, it's a huge headache. Right? Because remember that your photograph, uh, your, your camera has certain s-stops, which are roughly the amount of time your camera's open and collecting light. And so what are your two options if you use an old school camera to take a photo of, of a church? Either you see the stained glass window, or you see the inside of the church, but not both. <coughs> You see that? Because in order to capture the dark part of the church, you need a long expo exposure, right? There's not very much light there. But to capture the, the stained glass window without it just blowing out your camera, you want a very short one. Yeah? And so this is this issue of, of dynamic range, that in a photograph like the one I'm showing you on the, scene, in, in the, on the screen here, there's six orders of magnitude of, of color perception going on there, uh, and you can't capture them all at once. Uh, and, and largely this is because your eye is an extremely nonlinear thing, right? It doesn't just, like we talked about before, it doesn't just tell you brightness, it tells you brightness on kind of a log scale, right? That's why you can see sharp edges, even if there are just little tiny differences in brightness, as long as you're in a dark room, um, which is a good thing, I think, evolutionarily. Uh, so here uh, uh, is, is a more clear example. So here are different s-stops on your camera of an outdoor scene. Um, so they pointed it kind of right toward the sun. Uh, and you can see it even the, in the short uh, uh, camera exposure, you see the sun, and as you are open longer, you see the background, but what happens to the sun? Well, there's no sun anymore, it's just a big blown out uh, part of your scene. Yeah. Um, there's kind of a fun table you can look at here. So here's the kind of the approximate dynamic range of, of different brightnesses you see in a typical scene. So in a sunny landscape, it can be up to 100,000 to one in terms of like different brightnesses that your eye is processing all at once on a matte print, so that would be like a movie poster. Not even, a movie poster would be a glossy print. What would be a matte print, like this wall here? Uh, uh, the dynamic range is quite low, because it's flat. <coughs> um, but what that means is if you really want to capture realistic visual content, in particular outdoor, and when I say capture, I don't just mean photograph. When you, when you render, you run into the same problem. Um, you, you have to do something kind of clever and nonlinear. Yeah? So actually, you guys tell me, so what would I do? Let's say I wanted to photograph a church. Uh, who doesn't? And, 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 and uh, I, I want to capture sort of the full effect of being in that church, even though that's really not something I can do with a single uh, S-step. How, how am I going to solve this problem? And if your iPhone does this, by the way, by default. Yeah. Yeah, take my own photograph. called exposure fusion. Uh, and so, so the basic idea of, of exposure fusion is maybe I have an indoor scene like this one here. There are always churches, by the way. That's always where people go to test this stuff. Um, and they'll take uh, some images uh, with uh, very short exposure, and that way they can capture the detail of the stained glass window. They'll take other photos of very long exposure. Uh, and then what will they do? Well, they'll iterate over the, the pixels in the image. And they'll say, well, probably I want to choose the biggest, the, 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 the longest exposure where my pixel isn't just white. Okay? Uh, and so there's some, some pretty simple uh, image processing that happens to, to kind of movies and stuff. Does that make sense? Is this image on the bottom physical? No. Like, that is not simulating the light that's going in your eye. Right? The light that's going in your eye is really this huge dynamic range of, of color. Um, this is just trying to capture it in the, like, boring bandwidth of our, of our projector screen. And the great thing about perception is your brain doesn't care. It looks perfectly fine to do that. Yeah? Um, there are all kinds of different clever things that you can do when, if you're willing to take more than one photograph of a scene. This is sort of a big realization in the computational photography world about 10 years ago. That like, there are two different ways to make photography easier. Right? You can get a better camera, or you can get better software. And actually, these two things can kind of play off of each other in different smart ways. And, and I think you've seen that. For example, the evolution of your phone. Uh, now your phone has two cameras in the back, right, which is why you can simulate some depth of field on, on some of the latest uh, uh, telephones, um, whereas the other ones couldn't. Right? All they could do is just blur stuff out. Uh, and, and so uh, another great example, uh, uh, actually my favorite example, uh, is a technique where another issue with exposure is let's say that I have like a romantic candlelit dinner in a cave. You know, it's very dark. And I, and I want to take a photo and memorialize my, my, my dinner, yeah? Um, 
chances are, I think we would all agree, I'd want a short exposure for that photograph, or, or rather a long exposure. Um, but there's actually an, an issue, which is that photons are, are little discrete packets of, 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 of stuff that goes into your camera. It's beginning and end of my physics uh, understanding. Um, and and when, you're, when you're photographing a really dark, dimly lit room, you actually really are, are sitting there waiting for like individual photons to, to go into your camera. Right? What that means is that adjacent sensors in your camera may get kind of discreetly different colors because it just has to do with how many units of light went in there and that's happened in, in discrete chunks. And so what does that mean? That means that photographs in low light tend to be noisy, right? Because it just depends whether or not a photon landed on a particular sensor. On the other hand, what's a different way that I could have gotten uh, a detail in my, my romantic uh, cave day? Well, I, I could have uh, put a flash on my camera Right, and, and taking a photo of, of the cave with a flash on, and that's great, but then it doesn't look like my romantic candlelit dinner anymore, it looks like Costco, yeah? <laughs> uh, but, uh, when I put, but when, when I look at that flash photograph, what do I have? I have a perfectly sharp, high detail image because I have all the photons I want uh, going into my camera, yeah? And so, uh, one of the kind of interesting techniques that people will use is something called flash, no flash photography, which is exactly what it sounds like. They'll take two photos, one without flash and one with. And what they'll do is they'll do statistical analysis on the colors that you see in the low light photograph, but use the sharp edges that you see in the high light photograph and fuse those two things together. Yeah. Uh, that's a really clever uh, uh, technique for, getting, for simulating a high detail photo of a scene that you just can't capture. Yeah. Incidentally, there was a joke paper in, in so you have to, well, it. Well, I submitted my friend submitted it, and then sadly they, they stopped taking joke papers a few years ago. Uh, so the idea that I gave you there was, it was titled Vampire No Vampire Photography. And they had a, <laughs> but then they had a, had a scene. It, it was very clever, actually. They had a, a camera. So here's you know the, the Count from Sesame Street. Um, and uh, uh, you have your camera right here. And you have a beam splitter that's diagonal. And you have one sensor here and one sensor here. And as we all know, you can't see vampires in mirrors. Yeah, so, so if you take two photos, one here and one there, well, it was reflected there, so you don't get the vampire in this photograph. And so you can, uh, you can get a vampire map from your vampire, no vampire photography algorithm. Anyway, uh, okay, so, uh, right. Uh, but but this is the, the basic idea here is that by taking multiple photographs, uh, you get additional information about your scene. Um, another place where you see this is like capturing small children on, on film, rather. It's hard to uh, keep them from moving. I know I have two. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old niece, and, and, and taking a photograph of them is like this frustrating experience. Um, and, and so typically now, um, when you're in that scenario, what your phone will do is take a whole stack of photos uh, in hopes that one of them uh, is lucky enough to uh, uh, have, have both kids smile and look at your camera. Um, in fact, uh, if you're really sneaky, you take the whole stack and maybe one niece is smiling in this one, one niece is smiling in that one, and put together. Right? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a trickier uh, um, Anyway, uh, uh, these are all clever techniques that are essentially simulating a photograph you don't have. Uh, and, and, and these are the sort of neat things that are, are going on, uh, largely driven by the technology in your phone. Um, so a related one, uh, uh, which is a little simpler than, than, than high dynamic range, um, is, is tone mapping. Uh, where here, maybe your camera did a perfectly good job capturing the different intensities, but your eye does a bad job seeing them on the computer screen. Um, so what you do is you edit the intensities of the image to make them more obvious, right? In other words, to look at where there's contrast and accentuate it, um, just by remapping uh, color space, like we drew in that, that diagram there. Um, I think a lot of you guys can probably spot a bad uh, tone mapped image pretty easily. I think a lot of them live on Instagram right now, right? And they always have these like dramatic skies that look like the inside of a marble. Um, which really it just doesn't exist, it's not, it's not a thing. Um, but uh, it's an easy effect to get uh, in tone mapping. Um, tone mapping is a tricky matter, right? Because uh, if you just take tone range, like you, you take the darkest color and you make it zero, you take the brightest color and make it one, and you scale, um, the image you get still looks pretty flat and dark. Because really what dominates here is just the bright content, right? Um, and, and so the reality is that uh, really, your eye is, is sensitive to kind of logarithmic scale uh, and intensity, but your screen doesn't have the option of like blasting your eye with a thousand times more light in different 
of pixels, right? You, you, you've got a pretty low dynamic range of your display, right? And, and so in reality, uh, what happens uh, is you take the log of all your pixel colors, you rescale those, and then you exponentiate again. Uh, and that creates a nice uh, effect here. So, right, so I think that's a pretty long list of all the different filters we can do just on one pixel at a time. And you can see it's already a, a, a pretty good way to make some, some convincing effects. Uh, and these, again, aren't just things that you do in photos, right? So, for instance, if you render you know, a church uh, using your favorite shaders, you too will get this huge dynamic range. Uh, and you might choose to make one more fragment shader that makes a pass over your image and applies one of these HDR style photograph uh, filters for exactly the same reason you might do it with the camera. Yeah? Uh, uh, and that's perfectly fine. Of course, a sad fact is that most interesting filters on images involve more than one pixel at a time, uh, uh, and, and, and that makes your life a little bit harder. Uh, and, and, and so I thought we'd talk about a few of those. In fact, we've already seen one, um, uh, which is image filtering, right? So when we talked about mint mapping, uh, of course, one thing that's hiding inside of mint mapping uh, is being able to shrink an image, right? And of course, uh, what is the, the, the basic point um, in, in, in creating like this little guy here is that every pixel here corresponds to a whole neighborhood of, of, of pixels there that you have to average. Right? And so these are our, our picker algorithms to so get right. This is my mom's cat. Um, okay, so uh, right, so so this is a, there are all kinds of issues that show up uh, when you talk about these kinds of algorithms. And if you recall, many lectures ago, we already saw the kind of thing that could go wrong. Right? Like if I take this photograph of a hand, I shrink it a lot, then uh, we tend to introduce aliasing. Uh, artifacts and, and actually the same techniques usually apply uh, and exactly the same uh, issues that appear in the, the image filtering world. So for example, uh, let's say that I want to uh, minify or minificate or whatever uh, an image here. Right? So in other words, uh, small distances in this image are large in the original one. How should I do that? What should, what should I do? Well, a simple algorithm, of course, would be to do nearest neighbor interpolation and, and we I think thoroughly convinced ourselves in this class that you get some pretty bad uh, artifacts uh, when we do that. So instead, really, uh, what we need to do is take some kind of an integral. Yeah. Does anybody remember what 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 integral should I take to get a nice uh, filter result here? To avoid aliasing. Starts with the S. So, so yeah. <laughs> right. Then remember that this image has a particular Nyquist rate associated with the space between the pixels. And so really what I should do is take every pixel here to be this guy involved with the sync that you get uh, from that from that, from that space. Uh, and of course, uh, it's an interesting challenge uh, because the sync function uh, has you know this negative load. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the opposite of minification is magnification. Um, like here, we, we started with Samantha Small, we, we want to make her large, uh, so we need to grow the image. Um, in a sense, you're, you're less likely to get really irritating aliasing when you go in this direction, you just get ugly images, right? So for instance, in this class, uh, we talked about bilinear interpolation. Um, is bilinear interpolation from an image processing perspective a particularly good or convincing effect? No, right? So, so here, like, uh, uh, Sam's ears are diagonal, relative to the pixel grid, <laughs> yeah? Uh, and so when I make uh, uh, Sam large enough, what am I gonna see in her ear? I'm gonna see the boundaries of the pixels, right? And that's not so good, but at the same time, I could pretty reasonably find the slope of this line in this image. Like, that's not a totally unreasonable thing to do, right? So I could try to use that signal to actually help me with my upsampling. Do you see that? The, uh, I don't have to just bilinearly interpolate. It could be that I, I notice that the edge of her ear tends over a larger neighborhood to kind of go in this direction. And so maybe I actually balance, I, I bias my, my sampling algorithm toward that. And so there's actually some really clever uh, techniques out there where maybe I have this pattern here, and when I magnify it, you know, if I magnify it bilinearly, I just see the pixel grid. But if I first do something like detect a, a straight line here, and say that when I magnify it, I want to preserve that straight line, right, then I might be able to do better, like, like kind of bias my sampling to one side of the line or the other. Yeah. So this is, these are kind of clever techniques for, for edge preserving, magnification, minification. One of the great things recently, of course, is that uh, people have collected these huge data sets of photographs. Right? And so we tend to know what types of patches of pixels are commonly found in photographs. 
this is a weird statistical analysis that somebody, you can actually, before deep learning, it was kind of a clever thing to do, um, which is, let's say I take all the photographs on the internet, there's a lot of them, last I checked, uh, and, I, and I take all five by five patches of pixels in those photographs, right? So these are, are vectors in R to the 25, right? the 25 dimensional things, five times five. And as a set of points in R to the 25, it is not uniformly distributed. Do you see that? For instance, there are a lot of patches of constant color, right? So in other words, all 25 pixels are the same, right? There are a lot of other uh, uh, ones where, uh, one place, you know, so you just write grid, one, two, three, four, up. And uh, maybe there's a lot that are sharp edges, right? Are there very many, like, checkerboards? Probably not, right? Because these, these tend to be like very small patches on images, yeah? Uh, and, and so uh, an idea that shows up both in image compression and in, in, in upsampling here is, is one clever trick for, for, for making an image larger would be to say, okay, I'm gonna go in my giant database of photographs that other people have taken, and rather than like just applying a sync filter, I'm gonna find a five by five patch that kind of matches uh, the data that I have and just place that there in my, my upsampling filter. Uh, and indeed, that can create very high quality results, right? Because statistically, you're much more likely to find certain types of sharp edges. Than, than yeah. This is uh, something that people call natural image statistics, right? The, the statistics of five by five image patches is different from the statistics of just 25 numbers sitting in a vector. Yeah? So clever algorithms out there. Um, the most famous one of these is something called patch match. Um, this is built into Photoshop, uh, and it's really frightening. You can do things like cut a hole out of a photograph, and then tell patch match to fill it in, and often it will fill it with like kind of photographic looking content. And it does that just by grabbing five by five patches and just kind of gluing them in in a way that matches the data that you have. Yeah. It's really a boring algorithm. It's, it's depressing that it works as well as it does. <laughs> of course, there are many applications of sampling, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, we, we don't have to take Samantha and, and, and uh, you know, shrink the image uniformly. For instance, this cat is, is, is happens to be rather obese, and maybe I want to make her thin by, by squeezing the image sideways. Um, or maybe I want to take Mona Lisa and, and make her, her face uh, some crazy uh, uh, shape like this. Um, and so in general, uh, these are all examples of, of filters that look like convolution, right? Where what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm taking my output pixel, I'm writing it as some weighted average of, of input pixels on my, my, my original image. Yeah? Uh, and, and so I thought I'd spend just a minute defining convolution operator. Uh, and of course, now that everybody has uh, a bunch of machine learning uh, experience, you've probably have already seen this, which is different from the one I talked about five years ago. Uh, so let's say that I, I want to convolve, uh, this thing is my photograph, and this is my convolution filter. Right, so dark green means like kind of close to one, light green means zero. So what convolution does is it takes this little square, and it drops it on top of the image here, and then it says I'm going to take a weighted average of the pixel colors, in this square with these weights, and my output color is at the center pixel, is that weighted average, right? So for instance here, maybe I take that green guy and I put it on top, and that corresponds to the color that I should get here, you see? Uh, and so there's something, right, so that fills in that color. Maybe now the green guy, you notice that it's about to start interacting with the black, right? So it'll start making it darker, darker, and darker. And notice that in effect, I blurred out that edge, right? Because as I was walking along, with this green filter, it uh, intersected more and more in the black stuff, okay. uh, and, and so on. By the way, one common place that, that people usually get wrong is what to do on the boundary, uh, and there's no right answer there, uh, unless you're like, simulating a physical uh, uh, effect. Uh, okay, so, so oftentimes we tell this little green patch that we're dragging over the image a convolution kernel or a filter. Uh, these things are either learned or, or specified by the artist. Uh, and and they, they have a few properties. One is that they, they usually are, are summing to one. That makes sense, because they're weighted averages. Uh, and they're usually relatively small for efficiency purposes. Um, so in the image filtering world, uh, of course, you don't just have to learn them in your, your deep network, you can also just prescribe them to have different image effects. So for instance, if I want to blur out uh, the Taj Mahal here, I could just take a filter that <coughs> just looks kind of like a, a bell curve or something from the sensor. What if I wanted to detect sharp edges in my photograph? How would I, how could I do that? So I want to find pixels where there's a big transition from dark to light. Yeah? Um, you can like create a new convolutional kernel either like for detecting like uh, horizontal edges or like vertical edges and then like combine those two results together 
bridge and then sure. leave a diagonal into the same spot. And how would I detect a horizontal edge? Um, so for a horizontal edge, you would need to create uh, a convolutional code that just has like the center diagonal all like black and then everything else white. Yeah, so, so think about if I can, well, let's say I want to find a horizontal line. Uh, I have a convolution filter, which looks like one minus two, right? What's going on here? Well, or a, a pixel on a sharp edge has the property that the pixel color is quite different from the pixel colors nearby. Right? And so essentially what is this doing? It's saying, is this pixel in the center sufficiently different from, from its neighbors, in which case you sort of want a sharp edge. Yeah. In fact, I think even a, a similar one would be just one and minus one. Um, or if you want to detect edges on a whole image, uh, maybe you have a bunch of minuses on a whole board and then a plus four in the center. Yeah. And these are all things that people did uh, for many years. Uh, you know, before it was learned, these are just things you can prescribe. Uh, another one that's pretty common is uh, in, in 80s video clips, I think, uh, especially in advertisements for blockbuster video, is uh, embossing, where you kind of want to create a sort of 3D effect. Right? So maybe what you do is kind of average pixels on the front, but then accentuate it from stuff that's kind of diagonally offset. I, I think that's a little bit, yeah. Um, what's the big issue with convolution? As, as I make my neighborhoods larger, what happens to my code? I guess I make my kernel bigger and bigger squares of pixels. Well, it gets slower, right? Because with every pixel now, I have to loop over over all the, the colors nearby and take an average. Yeah. Um, because so, in other words, uh, you know, if I have an n by n image and an m by m kernel, uh, right? Then there are this many pixels in my image. For each pixel, I have to do this much work to take that average. So multiply them together to, for the runtime. And so large image filters are, are quite expensive. Um, if you take a Fourier uh, class, you'll learn that the, there are ways around that. Um, but, but they're still uh, quite tough to work with. There are also a lot of really big challenges with this sort of convolution-based uh, uh, image filtering. Uh, one that, that we briefly suggested uh, uh, in our lecture on, on Fourier is that, remember the sink has this little negative piece, right? And thanks to rounding, it might be that your output photograph has a little bit of negative color, uh, which isn't so good. We'll come back to that in just a moment. So for now, uh, let's talk about blurring photographs out, because that's the most common thing people want to do. Uh, so Gaussian kernels, right? So a Gaussian kernel means that I'm involving, I guess, a function which looks like e to the minus x squared minus y squared divided by some constant, uh, like that. Okay, so this is a function that's big in the center and drops off in the tail, so it's a pretty reasonable blur kernel. And this function has some really interesting properties. Right? So, so this is the kind of thing that we want to do really, really fast in the graphics pipeline. So for instance, let's say I want to simulate depth of field. Right? It's a pretty common task, uh, in, in, uh, actually in, in GPU rendering, because maybe I, I want to have a video game where the background of the scene is a little bit blurry and it really force the, the player to look at the foreground. So one way to do that would be to render all the objects in the background first, blur it out, and then render the stuff in the foreground on top of it. Is, is this a hack? Yes, it is a hack. Is it a reasonable thing to do? Absolutely. Um, but in, in that case, you need to have a pretty wide Gaussian filter on your, on your, your images uh, that are going through your GPU. Uh, yep. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to make Gaussian convolution fast? So, so let's, let's, let's write down a few properties of this function that are useful. Um, so first of all, uh, one thing that we know is that this is really uh, e to the minus x squared or squared, times e to the minus y squared. Oh, squared. It's just a property of exponents. Uh, and so in fact, uh, you can convince yourself in this relationship um, that this is something called a separable kernel. What that means is that if I want to blur in x and y together, one thing I can do is take my image and blur it in x and then blur it in y one after the next, and those are the same thing. Yeah, uh, and, and, and if you think about it, remember my runtime here, I can shave off this two here, because now I only have to do it in one dimension at a time, and I can do it in a more parallel fashion. Um, and this is the usual trick, uh, it, it, it is uh, something called separable convolution. Uh, and, and, and the idea here is that this sort of reduces our problem. We only have to be good at, at solving one dimensional uh, problems. Uh, 
That makes sense. Okay, so now I have to blur out essentially a signal of like, one variable. This is all good old school signal processing stuff. I like this stuff. Um, how am I going to do that? Do you guys have any good ideas? How could I blur out something with a really wide Gaussian curve so that m is a big number? On my GPU, as quickly as possible. There are actually a few different uh, uh, techniques you can do. How many of you have heard of the, the central limit theorem? Yeah? Well, all of you guys talk about doing machine learning. You, you, you ever heard of the central limit theorem? It's like basics and statistics. Ah. Uh, okay, so the central limit theorem essentially says you draw enough random variables, eventually they all look like bell curves. Yeah? Uh, if you like, take a bunch of random stuff, you average them all together, the, the distribution of the average it converges to a Gaussian. Yeah? Why is that useful here? Well, there's a really weird byproduct of the central limit theorem that you, you might not have seen before, which is that if I take my photograph and I blur it any way that I want to, it doesn't, care, it doesn't actually matter what my blur kernel is. If I blur it enough times, I just keep iteratively applying the same blur kernel, that thing will converge to a Gaussian kernel. <laughs> so what does that mean for in, in terms of sort of incentive? What it means is that I really should choose the fastest, small blur thing I can find and just apply it 10 times. And then suddenly I'll have something that looks an awful lot like, like depth of field. Uh, and so this is a sort of standard uh, uh, trick. By the way, notice I, I need the word uh, reasonable here. So if my kernel has shift everything to the right, obviously that will uh, converge uh, to, to Gaussian. Yeah. Um, so, so a good example here uh, is maybe the, the, the Gaussian kernel is kind of annoying. It has these long tails, which makes that M value kind of big. So maybe instead, I just replace it with a box. What happens if I, I convolve a box against a box? In other words, I apply two of them. Get a triangle. Yeah? Take a look. This is already starting to look a little, a little bit like a cash in. Yeah? What happens if I convolve this guy against a block, a box? I get a piecewise uh, parabola object that looks something like that. If I do it again, I get that, and so on. Yeah? So here's the thing. Just by what does it mean when I say convolve against the box? That's a very complicated phrase for take a pixel and replace it with the average of that pixel and its neighbors. Yeah, and if I iterate that process like five times, I have something that's pretty darn close to what I wanted anyway. Yeah? So notice uh, sort of the strategy I'm taking here, is we started with uh, an n squared m squared algorithm. We shaved off one of the m's by convincing ourselves that we have to do it in one dimension. And now somehow I have a, a simpler filter, which I'm just going to apply some constant number of times, right, like the box filter. Now, how quickly can I do a, a, a box filter? Well, this turns out to be a pretty, uh, uh, sneaky thing. Yeah. So let's say that I want to apply a box filter to this 1D signal. Okay. So in other words, I want a new array where every where the, 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 the color of this pixel is the average of the colors of these three pixels. Does that make sense? What does the value look like here relative to the value here? Notice that these two pixels are in common when I take that average. This is about we're about to get real sneaky here. Yeah? You see that? So do I need to add up three numbers? No. I could take this guy's average, subtract this value, and add the one on the right, and now I have the box filter applied to the next pixel. Notice that trick works even if my box is like 10 things wide. I can get a really wide filter this way. Yeah? And here's the thing. What is the, what is the, the runtime of this algorithm for, for running across this, algorithm, this, this array? It's just proportional to the length of the array. Yeah? So I've just removed that factor of, of, of m completely. Do you see that? Real sneaky. Yeah? So, so this is a, a sort of a state-of-the-art style uh, uh, technique for, for Gaussian blurring. Uh, uh, There's a few different things. Uh, one is that you blur an x and then in y, or y and then an x, it doesn't really matter. Well, you're like losing it back there, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, uh, rather than um, applying a fancy Gaussian filter, which would require you, you mean, having a whole box moving around on your image, Instead, you just apply this box filter a few times, and, and pretty quickly it, it approximates the Gaussian here. Obviously, this is, is an approximate, um, uh, but, but the runtime here is just n squared times k, where k is the number of times you can get it. It's just about as good as you can get it. There are other techniques that, that converge even faster this way. Uh, you could ask, like, why do you box and not some other filter? And, and the answer is, you can iterate anything you want, and so you might choose something that needs a smaller value than k. Um, but that's where the engineering uh, there are a lot of 
other algorithms people use, and other uh, popular one is a Gaussian pyramid, where you just keep taking your image and shrinking it by half, and then sort of replacing your pixel color here with some weighted average of the, 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 the pyramid there. The advantage being here that uh, this parallelizes nicely on your GPU, um, but the disadvantage being you now need uh, extra memory around to, to be able to apply this kind of filter. So let's really quickly uh, uh, do a quick experiment just for fun. Um, which is, is, is to check the, the details of these filtering things. And they're actually really subtle. Um, so one of the issues that you see in computational photography quite a bit is that people overdo it. Right? I think you guys have all seen over-edited photographs on, on people's personal uh, you know, social media pages. It's an easy thing to do on your phone. Right? And, and remember that with each filter that you apply to your image, you like, lose a little bit of numerical precision, there's some rounding, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's actually quite problematic. Um, so for instance, uh, here we've got a photograph of a dog. And uh, I, I did, or, or my colleague Andrew actually uh, did a, a quick experiment here, which is I took the dog and I rotated it 30 degrees 12 times. If I check 30 times 12, hopefully it's 360. Yeah? So in other words, this dog just did a wild, crazy uh, uh, spiral in the image plane. But every time I rotated it, I didn't just like rotate it conceptually, I rotated it and then sampled it back like I'm applying my image filter. Yeah? This is a pretty common scenario, right? I filter it, I didn't like it, I filter it again, I didn't like it, maybe I rotate it back, you know, uh, whatever. This is like, like I see, uh, for instance, my, 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 my mom on her Facebook page doesn't like the way that they lay out the photos, so she'll like put them in Microsoft Word and then place them and take a screenshot because she wants this particular layout and she doesn't like that, she'll put it back and take a screenshot of it again and so on. Uh, and every time you do that, uh, you incur a little bit of, of inaccuracy, right? You, you, you round it, you resize, you resample. Uh, and so on. So hopefully you can see what I'm getting at with this experiment. I just applied 12 different filters uh, to get me back to the image I started with. And so so far, uh, the, the input and the output look about the same. And now what we think I'm going to do is, is take this 30 degrees and, and, and decrease it. Yeah? So rotate it in smaller increments. So here, uh, I took my dog and, and rotated it 5 degrees 72 times. And you can already see that some artifacts are starting to happen. And now what do you think how, what do you think it looks like if I rotate one, one degree 360 times? It looks like that. <laughs> what goes wrong? What is, what is, this is like a very peculiar artifact. Any ideas? Like why should it be that like, like probably what I would have guessed would be that I was just going to gray image, right? Like everything's just kind of hard to show. Why is it black and white? Well, what is our ideal sampler for 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 for, region, for sampling? Remember, it's in sync function, <coughs> and sync has a negative load. Yeah? And so the reality is that when we do all this sampling and reconstruction, oftentimes every pixel undershoots or overshoots just a tiny, tiny bit. And when I iterate that behavior, right? So here, uh, the the convolution filter I use is Lonzo three, which is has this tiny little negative load to kind of account for the sync issue here. Um, what ends up happening is it actually accentuates the edges just a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, and if you do it 360 times, you, you completely lose the single in your image. And so, so largely this is an argument that um, when you do your image processing, you always should keep around the original, you know, the, 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 the raw camera data, uh, in case you screw stuff up. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's also a, a warning that the, uh, these things are still subject to the same sampling reconstruction problems we've already talked about in this class. And, and they really can, can, can cause some, some pretty serious images Issues. Yeah. Get them wrong. Of course, there are lots of different fun uh, filters you can apply. Another good one is something called unsharp mask. So this is a way to increase the uh, sort of contrast locally in a photograph. So this is, you know, I have a photo of a cat and I want to make my cat really dramatic. So what do I do? Well, I want to take the the, the, the pixel uh, at the center of some neighborhood and kind of make the difference between this pixel and its neighbors. Uh, uh, particularly large, so maybe I apply a filter which looks something like uh, essentially uh, what, like this, right? The idea being that like I want to push away from stuff nearby. Yeah, and or, or a different way of putting it is here: if G is a a Gaussian, right? Then if your image is convolved with the Gaussian, this is like the blurred out version of your image. Do you see that? So. This guy is the image minus the blurred out stuff. So this is like the high frequency content. So here, if I take beta to be a big number, what I'm saying is amplify the stuff that makes me different from the blurred out neighborhood nearby. 
And that's, this uh, filter is called an unsharp mask. Uh, and this is another pretty common uh, uh, one that gets applied in computational photography. Uh, let's say that I want, I have a piece of software for image processing. I want to figure out if it's using an unsharp mask. How should I do that? What image should I put in there? Any idea? I should show an image of just a flat edge. Because right? what's going to happen to that edge? Well, close to the edge, right? so far, far, far away from the edge, it's just, you know, basically these two images are going to look the same, so you're not going to see a difference. And then as I get close to the edge, suddenly the blurred out guy has stuff on the other side. Right? And I want to kind of accentuate what makes me different. Yeah? And so I get an artifact that looks something like this. So here's my input image, which is a flat spiral. And of course, if I look down here, what's happened is near the sharp edges, these pixels become more white because the blurred out image was a little more black, and I wanted to accentuate the difference. Right? Uh, and, and, and so this is another uh, common artifact, uh, which is called a halo artifact uh, in, in photography. Uh, and so this is a pretty common one you see. So for instance, uh, Sometimes when people take you know, photographs and really up the contrast content of uh, what you see or, or any simpler ones, you just filter it. Of course, all of these things uh, can be understood as, as linear filters, right? All they're doing is just aggregating pixels for the neighborhoods. Um, and there's a challenge with linear filtering, which is that it doesn't actually know about the content of your image, right? It's like taking a cookie cutter and just dragging across your image and applying the same thing in every pixel. And you can see that that causes issues. So for instance here, it didn't really know that like there's this pixel is gray because stuff below it is gray, and if I wanted to blur out my image, I should really just look down, right? I shouldn't look on the other side of the edge. And it can't know that because it's dragging the same convolution filter over the whole image. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole other area, unsurprisingly called nonlinear image filtering, that tries to address that. Yeah. Uh, and, and and so for instance, um, here's a simple thing you could do. Uh, so here uh, is, is, is a noisy photograph. We, we, we've displayed it as Z values, right? So it's just oscillating. Uh, and, and if you think about what are these image filterings doing? The, the filters doing? They're, they're taking a color here and they're replacing it with a weighted average of colors nearby. And one thing you could do is say, well, what does nearby mean? Well, so far it's meant nearby along the image. But you could also say that you also want to be nearby in color space, right? Because in other words, I shouldn't mix with colors that are like all the way on the other side of this cliff. And so one thing I could do would be to design an image kill kernel uh, based on two terms, right? One of which uh, is just measuring similarity in color space. The other is measuring, measuring similarity in uh, image space. <laughs> and multiply them together, and I get this like weird chopped off Gaussian here. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I get uh, is an output that still respects the sharp edges in, in, in my photograph. Yeah. And this is a technique called the bilateral filter. A lot of the early research on that happened in our, uh, our department here at MIT. Uh, and is, is one of the most common uh, image filters that, that are uh, implemented in, in different code. Um, I believe, for some reason, you know, in Photoshop, they like to take academic literature and just give it different names, just to be kind of annoying for those of us that have read the academic papers. So I believe Photoshop calls this surface blur. I don't know, does it, has anybody used this feature before? No? Um, and it's exactly that. It's a way to do an edge preserving blur uh, on a photo. So here, uh, it's well, not a particularly noisy photograph, but a photograph nonetheless. If I apply a Gaussian filter, you just get a blurry photo. If I apply the bilateral, look what happens. So like, for instance, in the background of the scene, all the pixels are dark gray, and they get blurred together, but you still can see the sharp edge of your shoulder here because there's this difference in intensity. Um, there are all kinds of fun uh, image filters that are not linear. So this is one. Uh, another good one is something called the median filter, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so the median filter, you take every pixel, you draw a little neighborhood around that pixel, and the filtered value is the median of that set of pixel colors. This is a robust image filter, meaning that if I have shot noise in my photograph, uh, that'll get removed. You guys know what shot noise is, by the way? This is also true in my cross copy. So shot noise is like, I have a camera which when it works, it works great, and when it fails, gives me a ran completely random color. This is different from captured noise, where it's like every pixel is a little bit off. So in shot noise, what I say is most of my image is reliable, but every once in a while I have a pixel that like is total garbage, right? Uh, and, and, and so shot noise appears in low light <coughs> photography, and it also appears in microscopy because in microscopy you're literally counting photons, right? Um, so in that case, the median filter is pretty useful, right? Because if I'm at one of these outlier pixels and I draw a neighborhood, I take the median, chances are I'll just ignore that outlier pixel altogether, and I won't average it in. Yeah? 
if you want a really great algorithms question, uh, here it is, uh, which is, let's say that I have, I, I want an image filter where every pixel is replaced with the median of the pixels in a square around that, 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 that center point. And my question for you is, how efficiently can you solve that problem? Uh, and it requires some, some clever data structures to be correct. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so with that, we'll, we'll start for the day. Um, so as, as a reminder, uh, on Tuesday we'll have one last lecture. I forget if our nano quiz Tuesday or Thursday, I think it's Tuesday. Um, and then uh, on Thursday we'll have uh, guest talks from uh, uh, people at MIT doing graphics research. Get ready to know what's going on in the state of the art. Uh, get cracking on your projects. I have office hours for the next, I guess, hour, hour and 15 minutes.